talk. So tonight we're going to be hearing from Professor Adam Schulman, who is one of the faculty members in the Department of Planetary Sciences. Um, Adam got his bachelor's from Stanford, his PhD from Caltech, and has worked on everything ranging from uh, atmospheres of strange planets and uh, to the, the surfaces of moons in the outer solar system and all sorts of stuff. Tonight, he'll be talking about weather and climate on planets orbiting other stars, a new frontier in planetary science. Adam. Thank you. Thanks for coming. It's a good turnout. It's a privilege to be here to tell you about this exciting new field. For thousands of years, um, humanity has wondered about the possibility of life and other worlds beyond that uh, of Earth. And for a long time, this was speculation alone. Of course, the ancients from thousands of years ago, without the use of telescopes, just with the naked eye, could observe the passage of Jupiter and Saturn and other planets across the sky. So we knew that there were these dots moving in space and then um, eventually found that these were other worlds. But uh, for a long time, we did, had no idea if there were worlds around other stars. Uh, however, this of course has been the subject of speculation. Um, you know, this is writings on this, uh, speculating about this, go back literally hundreds of years. In the more recent era, this is of course popularized in a whole genre of books and movies. I grew up in the Star Wars era. And this is showing the, the cantina scene where and some um, alternate, you know, maybe distant future. Um, it's so common to hang around with uh, other beings that you could just sip, you know, beer in a bar while these um, crazy aliens uh, play a tune. In the more uh, sort of recent past, we have movies like Avatar, um, you know, speculating about Earth-like worlds that are orbiting gas giants and the life and, uh, that goes on there. And this is becoming a real field now. We're at a historic point in human evolution, you could say. This is the first time ever in human history where we now know that there are planets orbiting other stars and we're actually able to learn about them. Um, in our lifetimes, this is uh, transitioning from a field of pure speculation to one where we can actually find out what nature has to offer. That's quite amazing. Of course, when you look at the night sky, this has shown the southern sky from New Zealand, you can wonder what is going on? You know, are there planets around each of these individual stars? And as I said, in the past we've had no idea, but now we're actually being able to, to discover that, to find that out. Just to summarize some of the big questions we're interested in, we'd like to know how common are planets around other stars? Do most stars have planets or are planets relatively rare? How massive are planets? In our own solar system, we have planets ranging from Mercury, which is uh, much uh, smaller and less massive than the Earth, through Jupiter, which is 300 Earth masses and 10 times the diameter of Earth. So in other solar systems, are most planets gas giants? Are they terrestrial planets like the Earth or something in between? How far are they from their stars? Are they close in? Are they very far out, um, like Pluto and beyond? Um, and what are their orbital properties? Do they have regular orbits uh, like we have in the solar system where most planets are on circular, quasi-circular orbits in a, a regular progression? Uh, and do alien solar systems resemble our own? As far as the planet properties, we'd like to know what are they made of? Are they, is the composition similar to what we're familiar with in our own solar system? Do they have atmospheres? And if so, what are their atmospheres made of and how massive are their atmospheres? Are these very tenuous atmospheres or are there planets with massive atmospheres the thickness of Earth and beyond? What is the climate on these planets? Do they have oceans? What is the distribution of temperatures, wind, water, and clouds on these worlds? in these worlds. And of course, this leads to the question of whether these planets are habitable. I'll make a distinction here between planets in a so-called habitable zone and whether they are in fact habitable. A habitable zone is the term that refers to the range of distances from a star around which a planet might be able to have liquid water on its surface. So the idea would be that if you put a planet too close to the star, if you started with liquid water, it would not be stable. It would just vaporize. It would just be a gas in the atmosphere. It would be lost to space, perhaps. If you're too far away, water would just freeze into ice. And in fact, many of the moons in the outer solar system are made of ice. But there's this intermediate range, this habitable zone, where planets could have liquid water. That doesn't mean they do. 
if a planet formed without liquid water, obviously it would not be habitable, or at least not of liquid water, even if it were in this range of distances. And this is all, of course, leading to the question of do planets in the solar neighborhood harbor life? We're starting to answer these questions rigorously, and we're not down to the bottom of the list yet, um, but reaching that point is doable in the next 50 years, I would say. Just to give a sense of the field, We've now discovered about 850 planets around other stars. These are often called extrasolar planets, or just exoplanets for short. And most of these have uh, discovered with the uh, so-called Doppler method. This is the method by which you don't directly detect the, pl uh, the planet. What you do is you, know, is you detect the uh, effect that the planet has on its star. And so when you have a planet, the planet has some mass, though it's, of course, less than the star. And as they're orbiting, um, the planet tugs the star back and forth. So the star itself is moving in a little circle due to the action of the planet. And we can actually observe the Doppler shift in that. In other words, the blue shift and the red shift um, back and forth, sort of periodic sloshing back and forth of the spectral lines on the star. And this tells us the period of the planet, in other words, how long it takes the planet to go around the star. We get information on the mass of the planet and also on the orbital properties, such as is the orbit circular or is it highly eccentric, in other words, oval shaped. And also, it turns out that in general, the planes, most solar systems we think lie in planes. Um, all the planets in our own solar system are in a kind of a planar geometry. And in general, the planes of solar systems are randomly distributed. So, um, you know, in general, if there's some star and it has a planet, then the plane of that solar system will not line up with the line of sight to Earth. But sometimes you get lucky, and if the plane of that solar system lines up with the line of sight to Earth, then the planet will pass in front of the star once per orbit, as viewed from Earth, and then half an orbit later pass behind. This leads to a periodic dimming of the light and allows us to detect the planet. I'll show animations describing this shortly. And this is good because it tells you the radius of the planet. If the planet is tiny, it's not going to block much of the star's disk, and so this dip in brightness will be small. If the planet's huge, it will block a larger fraction of the disk, and you'll see a much bigger drop. So you can get the radius of the planet, the size of the planet, out of this measurement. Combining the Doppler method with this transit, the so-called transit method, if you combine the mass and the radius information from these two methods, that means that we can learn the density. We can learn how much stuff is in every cubic meter, let's say. Um, is the density the same as that of, of uh, water or even lighter things, gaseous hydrogen, or is it um, dense rocky and iron type materials? We can actually learn that from these measurements. And, uh, also, these, um, just to emphasize, these techniques are, um, do not require the planet to be separately imaged. You don't need to take an image of the planet. Nevertheless, there are a number of planets now that are starting to be discovered by um, imaging them. Um, this shows an example of a very well-known system where there's four planets discovered. These are massive planets, several times more massive than Jupiter or more. They're very far from their stars, double the distance of Pluto from the star. Uh, and they are glowing very bright with a temperature of maybe approaching 1,500 to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That combination of properties allows them to be imaged. However, close-in planets like the Earth or Jupiter uh, are, un we, at the moment, we cannot image those, although um, all the technology is getting better in this, and we'll be able to image close-in planets better in the near future. This illustrates how the transit method works. So the idea is, let's see here, uh, oops, okay. So you imagine you have a star. Now you're not, you're not able to separately take a picture of the planet as distinct from the star. You only have the combined light um, from the two. Um, but what happens then is as the planet passes in front of the star, and you're not imaging this, but you see the drop in brightness. The data you get is down here in this bottom plot. You see the total brightness of the system over time, and it's dropped because the, star, the planet is simply blocking a part of the stellar disk. And then once the planet moves it off, you know, and this is just due to the orbital motion, and this takes a few hours, typically, um, then the light returns to normal. So as I said, from this, we can learn about the radius of the planet. And this gives a sense of the pace of discovery in this field. Um, on the top two plots, we're showing um, year of discovery versus mass and radius. So let's look at this plot first. So here we go from the late 80s, when there was a couple of tentative pl planet detections, up through about now. And so the first detections, um, sort of well-received and confirmed detections of planets around other stars were in the early to mid-90s. And those planets were massive and big. Um, those planets are the easiest to detect. They, they tug on their star the most, they have the biggest radii, and so on. And so this shows the mass in Jupiter masses. So this is one Jupiter mass. 
and this would be 10 Jupiter masses, this would be a tenth of a Jupiter mass, and a hundredth of a Jupiter mass. Earth is down here, so something Earth mass would be at this point. And you can see from the mid-90s, we started discovering more and more and more. We, they started discovering these Jupiter-sized planets, and we continued discovering those as we surveyed more and more of the sky. And as our technology got better, we were able to also detect less and less massive planets. And notice that this lower envelope of this curve crosses an Earth mass right about now. We are now able to discover Earth mass planets using this technique. This is a similar plot, but instead, and this is with the Doppler method that I described. Uh, and this is a similar plot, but showing the radius of the planet as discovered using the transit method. So here again, we have Jupiter radii, and so this is one Jupiter radius, 10 times an Earth radius. So an Earth radius would be down here, this lowermost sort of gray line. And so again, initially the planets were discovered um, were large. Jupiter mass are even larger, a Jupiter, mass, a Jupiter radius and a half. And over time, um, we were able to uh, discover smaller and smaller planets. And again, we're now at the point of being able to discover Earth-sized planets. So we're now discovering Earth mass and Earth-sized planets. This shows a collection of the planets um, that we've confirmed as a function of how far they are from their stars, what we call the semi-major axis, with Earth um, being 1 AU, um, that would be here, um, versus the planet mass in units of Jupiter mass. So 1 Jupiter mass is here. And so, uh, of course, we can't detect small planets very easily, which is why this part of the plot's blank, and we're just detecting the most massive ones. And most of these then were discovered with the Doppler method and the transit method. A few of these ones way, way out here, are much further than Pluto. Pluto is a distance of about like so. Um, these were discovered by direct imaging. But all of these ones here, we're not imaging them at all. We're just detecting them through the Doppler method and the transit method. And what's interesting is that we're detecting lots of planets that are very, very close to their stars um, at distances that are 0.05 astronomical units, which means they're 20 times closer to their stars than Earth is to the sun. Maybe five times closer to their stars than Mercury is to the sun. These planets take three days, three Earth days, to go around their star. So their year, quote unquote, is three Earth days long. They're blasted by starlight, and their temperatures are up to three to, three to 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So extremely hot. This is telling us that our solar system, um, there are probably other solar systems like it, but not all solar systems are, are like that. There's a lot of crazy stuff out there in the, in the universe. I've alluded to this um, sort of distinction in how you discover planets. There's been a real shift in the characterization of philosophy. Once you discover a planet, you'd like to characterize it. The old view, and this was, of course, makes sense intuitively, um, and, and made so much sense that NASA really embraced this view throughout the 1980s and 90s, is that you can't really characterize a planet unless you're able to actually image it, unless you can take a picture that distinguishes the light of the planet from its star. And this led to uh, you know, lots of studies and a significant amount of work being done on concepts like the terrestrial planet finder, which was a concept for a NASA um, spacecraft mission, which would have been extremely expensive because in order to image an Earth-like planet um, at the distance of Earth from the sun, you have to have uh, extreme technology. You have to have multiple sort of spacecraft and flying formation or other sophisticated technology that's quite a bit beyond what we can do now. Um, it is doable, uh, but it would cost uh, billions and billions of dollars, probably 10 billion or more. Um, a lot. And it turns out, though, the new view is that um, even though this method's great for discovering the hot planets that are very, very young and gigantic, like Jupiter, that are way, way out far away, um, that for discovering closer in planets and characterizing them, the new view is that when a planet transits, a huge amount of information can be gleaned about its atmosphere without the need to ever separately uh, resolve the planets from its star. So Hubble Space Telescope, for example, was launched back in, I think, 1990, and of course has been a workhorse for many fields of astronomy and planetary science. And it turns out that Hubble has been great for this, that um, this is not some fancy thing that's decades in the future. This is you know, technology that's now 20 years old, and yet we can use it um, with this new philosophy to actually characterize planets. Spitzer is another space telescope that's been up um, for maybe six or seven years now, which is very similar to Hubble, except that it observes at longer wavelengths, the infrared wavelengths, um, several times longer than the wavelengths you can see with your eye. There's other future mission proposals, some and missions that will occur. Uh, one that people may have heard of is the James Webb Space Telescope, or JWST. Um, it's a massive space telescope that will be kind of a replacement for Spitzer with a much, much bigger mirror, much more sensitive, that will really revolutionize the field beyond everything that I'm telling you today.
There's also more focused missions, such as FINESS, which is a, a proposal for a NASA mission, and ECHO, which stands for the Exoplanet Characterization Observatory. It's a proposal for a European mission. Um, these have a significant chance. They're not guaranteed, but they have a significant chance of flying. And if they do, they're dedicated specifically. They're tailored for this new style of, of characterizing planets, and they'll be really uh, quite stunning for that. Uh, okay, so this illustrates kind of how you get information from this. So here you have a star, imagine a planet, and you'll get lucky enough so that the planet crosses in front of a star once per orbit. And so um, first you have the planet going around the star, and notice that um, during part of the orbit, like right here, the, day, the night side of the planet's facing the Earth, and then, and then later the day side rotates into, view, rotates into view. So you can see that the phases of the planet are shifting. If there were a day-night temperature difference on the planet, you might be able to see that, for example. Once per orbit, the planet passes in front of the star, and that leads to a drop in the total light that you receive. And then half an orbit later, the planet passes behind the star, and that leads to another event where the flux drops. So you have this huge drop when you're blocking part of the starlight, and then half an orbit later, as you go behind, um, you block the planet's light. So, in other words, um, when the planet's out here, say, you're seeing the combined light of the planet and the star, and when the planet is behind the star, you get the light only from the star. And so from this, we can learn the size of the planet. And from, that second, um, from this uh, second event um, called a secondary eclipse or an occultation, uh, we can learn information about the planet's temperature. So this, um, let me play this one more time. So we're seeing the phases change here. The planet passes in front of the star. And in this light curve, the two main events you see are this transit, when the planet goes in front of the star, and the so-called secondary eclipse, half an orbit later when the planet goes behind the star. But you'll notice there's actually a little dip. The background is not flat. So let's zoom in on that. Show basically the same animation, um, but zoom in on the, on, the, uh, on the plot so that we can actually um, see the variation in the light radiator, the heat radiated uh, by the planet toward Earth. So when the night side of the planet is facing the Earth, the night side might be cooler and the flux would be lower. And then when the, day, when the planet rotates around and the day side is aiming toward Earth, the flux will be higher because the, the heat of that day side is radiating toward Earth. And so you get not only this transit event here and the secondary eclipse here at the top, but you see this regular variation of the background in between those events uh, that tell you something about the day-night temperature difference on the planet. And so again, using this data without ever separately taking a picture of the star, we can learn the size of the planet, we can learn its temperature from the depth of the secondary eclipse, and we can learn the temperature difference between the day side and the night side. There's other ways to learn about planets. So imagine that the planet is transiting the star. So as viewed from Earth, let's say in the middle of a transit, the planet's sitting in front of the stellar disk. Here's Earth, and we have, say, the Hubble or Spitzer Space Telescope looking at it. So some of the light from the star, and I've shown the light with two different wavelengths here, um, just sort of schematically illustrated in, in one wavelength in white and the other one in, in red. So in, in one of these wavelengths, imagine that the atmosphere is transparent, that the atmosphere does not absorb at that wavelength. Um, that's so, uh, schematically illustrated by this, these white squiggles. So in those cases, well, let me first say that some of the light at both of these wavelengths doesn't hit the planet at all. It just you know, radiates off the star's disk and goes to Earth and can be seen by Hubble. Some of the light is just hits the backside of the planet, and, and all of that's going to be blocked. And the interesting parts are the, are the bits where the light is passing through the planet's atmosphere, just this little bit here. And I've schemat schematically shown that at this white wavelength, the atmosphere is transparent, and so this wavelength can proceed unhindered through the atmosphere, whereas at this red wavelength, the atmosphere is opaque. It is absorbing at that wavelength, and so the atmosphere blocks that signal. What this means is that the size of the planet, the radius that we measure using this transit technique, is a function of wavelength. The radius of the planet will look bigger at wavelengths where the planet, planet's atmosphere absorbs light, and the planet will look smaller at wavelengths where the planet's atmosphere is transparent. Effectively, then, we are building up a so-called transmission spectrum of the planet. 
Um, this is actual data um, for a particular planet, exoplanet. Um, this shows absorption in percent. This means that the planet's blocking about 2% of the stellar uh, disk when it's sitting in front of the star. But it's not exactly 2%, and the exact number depends on wavelength. This is wavelength in microns from 1 to 10. So visible wavelengths are out here, and this would be 10 times visible. So this is the heat wavelengths you, can, you can't see with your eye, but feel. And so, and so these point, these uh, blue crosses are the data points, and they show these characteristic up and down patterns. And we can compare those to the characteristic fingerprints that we know that specific gases have. Every gas, whether it be hydrogen or carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, water vapor, oxygen, whatever it is, has a very characteristic fingerprint about uh, which wavelengths it absorbs radiation. And so we can compare. Uh, and we can measure that in the lab, and we can also calculate that using basic physics, sort of quantum mechanics. And we can compare that to the particular wavelengths um, at which this planet is absorbing. And that allows us to identify what the composition of this planet's atmosphere is. I might also say that most of these planets, if you have a planet that's Jupiter size and Jupiter mass, we already know it's a hydrogen body. A planet that's Jupiter size and Jupiter mass cannot be made of anything but hydrogen. If we're made of anything else, even helium or any, anything else that Earth is made of, um, it would be much smaller um, than Jupiter if it were one Jupiter mass. Um, and so we do know these interiors of most of these big, the biggest of these planets are hydrogen. And we can learn that their atmospheres have, for example, trace constituents of water, methane, carbon monoxide, and so on. Um, some of the best signatures are actually for rather exotic things. This is illustrating these spectra. Um, for example, if you look here, this is um, wavelength. And uh, you know, so this is in the middle of the visible range. Um, so this is um, toward the red side of the visible and toward the blue side of the visible over here. This is the radius of the planet relative to that of the star. Um, the, this, this line is a model. The data are shown in these points here. And they mostly fit this curve. Um, but they spike up at this one point, um, which is a telltale signature of sodium vapor in this planet's atmosphere. This is one of these very close-in planets, the so-called hot Jupiter that's 20 times closer to its star than Earth is to the sun. And therefore, the temperature of this planet is enormous. It's a hydrogen planet like Jupiter with a temperature of 2,000 Kelvin. And under those conditions, things that we think of as metals on the Earth, like, uh, like sodium and potassium, are actually in gas form on this planet. And it turns out that those, that those compounds are very easy to detect spectrally. And so we've identified the signature of them. This shows the data for, another, for that, in fact, that same planet um, using this uh, method of trying to infer the um, variation in phases throughout the orbit. Um, so this shows an infrared wavelengths at 8 microns, um, the ob observations from the Spitzer Space Telescope. So here, you know, you're seeing the total signal. Again, we don't have an image of the planet. This is the combined light from the planet and the star. Here's a drop of about 2% during this event is when the planet's in front of the star. And then half an orbit later, the planet goes behind the star. So the existence of this event then is solely due to the heat radiated from the planet. If the planet were not radiating heat, then when the planet went behind the star, nothing would change as far as the light that we see at Earth, right? Um, the only, and this is at heat wavelengths at infrared. So um, the only reason there's a drop at all is because the planet's glowing. And suddenly, as the planet goes behind the star, we temporarily can't see it anymore. Um, and then if we blow up the scale, uh, this bottom plot is showing the same thing as in the top, but it just blow, expands the scale. We can see that there's this variation where the planet, uh, the total flux is initially low and then it rises. And so as was shown in the, in the animation, and what's happening is that in this part, when the um, transit happens, the night side of the planet is aimed toward Earth. And then gradually, the night side rotates out of view and the day side rotates into view. So we're able to get the day-night temperature difference out of the signature. And it turns out that there's actually um, an offset, too, that allows us to infer something about the specific temperature pattern. It's not just a matter of saying, what's the temperature of the day side and night side. You can actually invert the specific shape of these curves into a pattern for what the temperature is as a function of longitude around the planet. And that's what's shown here. Um, this is what the first map of temperature patterns ever obtained on an extrasolar planet back in 2007. And so this map is drawn in such a way that the substellar point, in other words, the high noon, the point on the planet where the sun is directly overhead, is sh shown here at the center. What's interesting is that that is not the hottest place on the planet. The hottest place on the planet is shifted to the east by several tens of degrees of longitude. These planets are so close to their stars that we think they're tidally locked. 
Um, the moon, of course, always has one face aiming toward the Earth. That's because of the effect of tides on the moon um, despun it early in its history and locked it into place. And uh, we think that the same thing has happened with these planets around other stars if they're sufficiently close like this one is. And the existence then of this displacement, uh, this offset, must be due to winds in this planet's atmosphere um, blowing the temperature pattern around. So this is evidence for meteorology, for weather in this planet's atmosphere. There's, we now have light curves for a wide range, maybe approaching 20 hot Jupiters now. The one that I showed you is among the better ones that we have, but there are a number of very uh, other nice ones. And these show a wide range of behaviors. And from these, it's able to, uh, we're able to um, infer um, something about the day-night temperature difference on this wide range of planets. Let me actually skip forward to this. And so from this, um, there's actually a trend emerging. So this is um, data from light curves from a bunch of different planets. Um, the first planet that I showed you um, was this one here, and um, some of the others that I showed on the previous slide are some of these other cases. Um, the uh, x-axis on this plot is, tells you how hot the planet is in an average sense. Um, so basically planets that are extremely hot, that are either very close to their stars and or they're around stars that are massive and huge, so they're really glowing brightly. Those hot planets are over on this side, and the cooler planets are over here. Cool in a relative sense. They're still very, very hot. Um, and this effectively shows the fractional day-night temperature difference. Um, so for example, on this planet, the night side is, um, you know, let's say 2,000, uh, 2000 Fahrenheit, and the day side is 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so it's a significant difference, but still fractionally, you know, it's modest, 20 to 25 percent. And when you get to these planets that are really, really close in, it turns out that the fractional day-night temperature difference is huge. What that means is that the day side is extremely hot and the night side is extremely cold. The difference in temperature from one side to the other is rivaling the actual temperature itself. What's interesting about this is that atmospheres don't like to have huge temp temperature differences. The Earth's atmosphere, especially in the tropics, is very, very good at regulating the temperature patterns. The tropics are almost the same temperature everywhere, regardless of whether it's day or night and, and uh, almost independent of longitude. There's some air, you know, contrast between ocean and land, but quite homogenous. And the reason is because Earth, there are dynamical mechanisms in the Earth that mute the day-night temperature differences, that um, homogenize things. And what this information is telling us is that those mechanisms break down um, for these very, very hot planets. Um, and so this is quite interesting. <laughs> Um, so we're sort of pushing our understanding of climate and meteorology um, outside the confines of our solar system. Um, yeah, maybe I'll just skip that one. Um, we can make models of this kind of, um, you know, these types of planets. Of course, the field of understanding climate and weather on the Earth is very well developed. There's a whole class of uh, models for predicting the weather on short time scales, for trying to predict um, how climate will change. Um, due to anthropogenic CO2 increases on long time scales and so on. Um, by comparison, um, trying to understand what happens um, on other planets, either on our own solar system or in, uh, other solar systems, is um, in its relative infancy. These models are not as sophisticated, and, um, but they allow us to understand um, sort of physical processes that happen on the Earth when pushed to the limit. Earth while we have great data on it, is just one specific outcome. It's just one specific example among a whole infinite um, continuum of possibilities. And so studying exoplanets is allowing us to um, really sort of uh, push our knowledge uh, to the envelope, to the limit. This shows a sequence of models that I did, actually, um, which are very simple and are intended simply to illustrate how um, when you make planets hotter, you can naturally increase the, their day-night temperature difference. So when a planet is cold, um, then what that means is that cold stuff doesn't radiate that well. You know, if you take something that's cold and you know, uh, you know, try to see how much it radiates energy to space, it does not radiate that much. You can't feel heat coming from a cold object. Um, that means that you know, if you have uh, a planet, even if it's tidally locked, even if it's only getting sunlight on its day side, shown, which is in the middle here, um, then if air is on the day side and migrates over to the night side, there's just not time for it to cool off because it doesn't radiate very effectively. And therefore, the atmosphere can homogenize the temperature. Um, and this happens better in longitude than in latitude. And you end up with a pattern sort of like this, where you have a significant, possibly, equator to pole temperature difference, but very little temperature differences in longitude. Um, and this planet, then, on that plot, 
um, would show up um, at a low value here. It would have a very similar night side temperature to day side temperature. On the other hand, hot planets, when the temperature is high, um, then hot materials radiate well. And of course, radiating well means that they're radiating their own energy away. They're losing their own energy, and that allows them to cool off. And therefore, if a planet's hot, as the air goes from day side to night side, there's plenty of time for that, um, even if the winds are fast, for the air to cool off, radiate its energy to space, and cool off on the night side. And therefore, you end up with this huge day-night temperature difference, um, you know, with the night side 1,000 or 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit colder than the day side. And this also affects the wind patterns, as you can see here. I won't get into the details of that, but you go from this banded pattern that's similar to the banded structure we see in the atmosphere of Earth or Jupiter, let's say, and you go to a pattern where the air is simply flowing from day side to night side on this planet at very high altitude, and there would be a return flow in the other direction at depth. And so, um, you know, if you were to then, um, you know, calculate from these models the sort of synthetic uh, expect, you know, observables, the synthetic light curves, um, you would find that it actually explains this trend quite nicely. So we're starting to come to some understanding of this. Also, um, what about this, this shifted hotspot? It turns out that this was actually predicted five years before it was observed. There's a whole class of three-dimensional models now um, of uh, Really, and these are adapted from climate and uh, weather type models that uh, were developed in the context of the solar system that are being applied now to these other planets or on other stars. And it turns out that when you have a planet that's tidally locked to its star, so it has a permanent day side and a permanent night side, and there's a huge um, day side heating and night side cooling, that the planets naturally tend to develop a very strong eastward jet stream at the equator. This is different than what Earth has. Earth has the jet streams here in mid-latitudes, like here where we are in Tucson, it's just kind of on the southern edge of the influence of the jet. Um, you know, and so if you're from, say, the northern part of the US, Seattle or the East Coast, uh, Boston or something, typical weather that you get, especially in winter, with these storms that come through the nor'easter that hit in the, a little while ago, for example, in the New England area, um, those are due to the jet stream, which is at mid-latitudes on the Earth. Um, these planets seem to be different. They have a massive jet stream, which is focused at the equator, and this has the effect of essentially blowing the temperature pattern downstream. So in this model, the, 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 the substellar point, the high noon place where the sun's overhead, is right in the center of the plot. But even in this model, that's not where the hottest place on the planet is. That, place, that point is shifted, just as it is in the data. And so this actually provides indirect evidence um, that we have indeed a superrotating or so an eastward jet at the equator on this planet that's analogous to what's actually seen in these models. One can even push it further and do comparisons. Um, so I showed that light curve from the Spitzer Space Telescope for one of these hot Jupiters. And we have light curves like that and actually a whole bunch of different wavelengths. Different wavelengths are shown here in different colors with these little points being the observations. And so from these kinds of three-dimensional climate models of these exoplanets, we can calculate synthetic light curves. In other words, what would the light curve look like if this, if this model was the real planet? And those are shown in these, in these smooth curves, um, again, color-coded by wavelength. And you can see that the um, smooth curve at a given wavelength uh, fits the data points pretty well. The, point, the fit is not exact, and that's probably because this model is oversimplified. It doesn't maybe have the right chemistry or composition. There's no clouds in this model. If there's some haze or clouds on the planet, that could change things. But we're in the right ballpark. And this is pretty amazing, considering that this planet is 60 light years from Earth. Um, that we're starting to be able to actually characterize the climate and weather on these very distant planets. I'll also just mention that these planets that I've shown you are exotic from the point of view of being very, very hot, you know, hot enough to melt lead and so on. Um, but there's lots of planets that are exotic in other ways too. The planet that I just showed you is one that was on a fairly circular orbit, um, albeit one that's very tight in and close to its star. But there are also lots of planets that are on highly eccentric orbits. This is a planet um, known as HD 80606b. Um, these planet names are just catalog names. Um, there's so many planets, nobody's bothered to try to give them real names. And this eccentricity of this is huge. I mean, you know, if you care about eccentricities and know about that, that's, this is an eccentricity of 0.93. I mean, you can see it here. It's, you know, it's like the uh, shape of a long loaf of French bread or something. And so this shows to scale. Um, of course, this is in another solar system, but I've overlaid on top of that, just for reference, um, the relative shape and location of the orbits of Mercury, Venus, and Earth um, that would exist if you overlaid them. And you can see that this planet at the farthest point is almost as far from its star as Earth is from the sun, but then it dive bombs in, and these points, these little black points on this orbit are, are, are spaced evenly. 
So if you know about Kepler's law, you notice that it, know that as this planet comes in, it will really just pick up speed as it free falls toward the star and shoot past the star very, very fast, equal area and equal time type <laughs> stuff. And, uh, and so and at the close end point, it's 20 times closer to a star than Earth is to the sun. And if you calculate out what this means for the amount of starlight the planet's getting, it's getting 800 times more starlight at the close end point than at the far out point. This is a hot Jupiter, meaning this is a gas giant. There's no surface to stand on. But if you could imagine being on a world like this that had an orbit like this, just imagine what it would be like. Out here, the size of the sun and as seen in the sky uh, of that planet um, would be similar to the size that we see in our own sun from the Earth. As the planet dive-bombed in, the planet would grow 20-fold in size until it was this close in point. The star would be covering a huge fraction of the sky. And of course, all the heat from that is going to cause a, ma a massive um, burst in the temperature of the planet. Um, so this is a pretty crazy world. <clears throat> Still, uh, the worlds that I've shown you are a bit exotic from the point of view of what we see here on Earth, and we're really interested in whether there's other planets like the Earth out there as well. This is one of the main goals of the NASA Kepler mission. This is uh, a mission, an unmanned mission that, that uh, um, was launched about four years ago now, and it's just been approved for another four years. Um, this shows Kepler being prepared on the ground before launch. Here's a person for scale, just to give a sense of how big this thing is. It's a big robot. Um, and this is an artist schematic of kind of what it looks like deployed. It's basically just a giant telescope with a bunch of very sensitive detectors on the back end. And this thing, um, unlike, say, the Hubble or Spitzer Space Telescopes, this thing was optimized specifically for this transit method of detection. Um, when Hubble was launched, we, we hadn't even discovered any planets around other stars, and we had no idea that this method of transit detection would be so fruitful. Um, but now that we know that, we can specifically design spacecraft with the stability and other properties that are needed to really maximize the gain from this. Kepler is staring continuously at one chunk of the sky um, for now eight years, it's halfway through that. And it's not a very big chunk. This is the, showing the Milky Way, and here's um, Cygnus the Swan. Um, and this little set of boxes shows the field of view of Kepler. So it's staring just at that one chunk. And the mission is just to look at that one set of sky and to observe 150,000 stars continuously for this eight-year period, um, and then from that to detect the transit signals. From the ground here on Earth or from Spitzer and Hubble, we can get information about these biggest of planets and the hottest of planets, these hot Jupiters, but we can't detect an Earth-sized planet very easily. Kepler is designed specifically to do that, to discover Earth-sized planets um, in the habitable zones of other stars. This shows what Kepler is discovering. Um, as I showed you before, maybe I'll just briefly skip back to the, um, to the at the beginning here. Um, so you might notice if you look at this, plant, this plot, so this is planet radius versus year of discovery. And again, these planet radii are mostly you know, Jupiter radii. And we're starting to discover, and this is from the ground and using you know, um, transit searches from the ground and so on. And we're just starting to discover a handful of, of planets that are approaching Earth size. And what Kepler is showing us is that tiny planets dominate. So this is a plot from Kepler and uh, data. And so here is showing orbital period in days. And so notice that, of course, Earth year is 365 days long. And these are planets that have periods of, say, a few days or 10 days or out to 50 or more days. So these are close-in planets. It's easiest to detect those because um, imagine that you know, other solar systems have planes that are random with respect to uh, our line of sight. And the sun is some big size, and if a planet is very, very close to its star, then it will transit over a wide range of, of uh, orientations. I could even draw it on here. Um, so imagine that here's the star, then, um, you know, so, and here's Earth out here, and we're observing. Um, and so if the planet is very close in, it could, you know, have an orbit. Let's say you know, the plane of that solar system could be some crazy angle, and from Earth it will still transit in front of its disk. It will still block some of the light. Um, or maybe it happens to be totally edge-on, or maybe it's the other way. And, and so for that wide range of possible orientations of that orbit, we would see that planet. On the other hand, if the planet is way, way out here, we're not going to see it if, it's the, if the solar system is that tilted. In that case, we would only see it if the uh, orientation of that solar system is over some relatively narrow range. What that means is that there's a huge observational bias to detecting planets that are close to their stars using this method. 
And that's why we're focusing here on these planets that are very, very close. Still, Kepler has been designed to detect planets as far out as the Earth is, um, but this takes longer. You have to sample for longer and look at more stars. So this shows the size relative to Earth. So here's one Earth radius. Um, Neptune is about four Earth radii. Jupiter is 10 Earth radii. And so this is showing this population of planets. Of course, when planets are tiny, it's hard to detect them. The signals are weak, and you know, you, it's hard to dis separate out uh, the signal from the noise. And so um, you, know, you see this huge bulge of points here, and the absence of points down here is simply because we can't detect things that small. We don't know if there are planets down here or not. The relative absence of points or, or um, sort of dearth of points over here on the right is due to this observational bias that I just drew on the board here. It's much easier to detect these close-in planets than the further out planets. But the um, drop in this direction as you stay in this, start in this cloud of points and then move upward, that's a real effect because it's much easier to detect a Jupiter-sized planet than a, a planet that's one or two Earth radii, and yet we're detecting way more planets that have two to four Earth radii than we are planets with Jupiter's radius. So this is telling us something new that we did not know before, which is that planets of one to 10 Earth radii in size are extremely common in the universe. Um, planets of Jupiter size, at least close to their stars, are not that common. They may be more common far, farther out from their star, um, Jupiter's orbital period is Jupiter's five times further from the Earth than the Sun is than the, from, from the Sun than the Earth is from the Sun with an orbital period of 10 years. So we can't say anything about that yet. But in any case, this class of planets is called super Earths. This term that's been given to planets between one and 10 Earth radii. Now Jupiter is a gas giant. It's just a big ball of hydrogen. It's a very interesting planet. There's lots of neat things to study about its chemistry and its connection to solar system formation and its meteorology and how that works on a bottomless atmosphere. But it's not really what we're thinking about if we're interested in, say, life and climates you know, where life might exist. And of course, Earth is. And Neptune's somewhere in between. Neptune is also a gaseous body. It's not totally hydrogen. It does have lots of water inside, but it's all fluid. It's still basically a gas giant. And so, What's interesting is that in, the, in, in Uranus, I might mention, is also the same size and radius as Neptune and is very, very similar. So in the case of our solar system, there is no planet between the Uranus and Neptune at end of the gas giant population and Earth. Earth is the biggest and most massive of the terrestrial planets. So how do planets in that, in that range behave? If you have a planet that's one and a half or two or three or four Earth radii, is it a gas giant? Or is it a terrestrial planet that might have a thick atmosphere? Um, you know, and what's the continuum? So we don't actually know that. We can speculate, but we don't know. And this data is helping us to find that out. This is kind of a complicated plot, and I don't want to um, focus on the details, but the axes are the same. So basically, orbital period here and planet radius. And as I mentioned, this plot has lots of biases. Um, we can't detect anything down here because they're just too small. It's hard to detect the stuff out here because maybe the stuff doesn't transit that easily. Or even if it did, you have to wait a long, long time to even see a transit because the orbit's so long. Um, but what you can do, we know how those biases work. And so you can try to correct the data for those biases to get kind of a, an unbiased estimate from this data of what the actual populations are. And so that's what is um, attempting to be shown whoops, um, in this plot. And so um, again, so um, this is one Earth radius, two Earth radii, four Earth radii, 10 Earth radii, which is Jupiter. Um, and this is orbital period, so from about an Earth day to 50 days. So again, these are the close-in planets. And the blue color means that the, our estimate is that there are not many planets in that little box. In other words, planets that have roughly that radius and, that's, and that orbital period, statistically, when you survey across these thousands of systems, uh, there's not many planets there. Uh, red means there are lots of planets there. And so again, this is showing us that there are lots where it's red is the planets that are, that are um, very, very small and also not quite so close in. So this, is, this red region is where there are lots and lots and lots of planets. So just to kind of recap some of that from Kepler, Kepler has detected 2,300 candidate planets. I mentioned at the beginning um, about 850 planets detected. Kepler folks are very cautious about what the, when they, uh, the terminology they use. Um, they refer to a planet as being discovered only when they have numerous multiple ways of cross-checking it. And so from their point of view, Kepler has so far discovered maybe 100 planets, give or take. 
Um, but we have about 2,300 candidates, and it's, it is possible for a candidate planet, something that looks like a transit, to be caused by something else. Maybe there's two stars orbiting each other, and they just clip each other just a little bit, and it produces um, a signature that looks a bit like a planet orbiting a star. It is possible, though, to remove most of those biases, and the Kepler team has done an excellent job of that. And so statistical studies have been done which show that probably 90 to 95 percent of these candidate planets are real. What that means is that for any given one of them, you can't know for sure if it's a real planet as opposed to what we would call a false positive. In other words, a fake signal that's tricking us into thinking it's a planet. Um, but statistically, 90% of these or more are real planets. So what that means is that if you add these to the 850 other planets that we've discovered, we now have discovered about 3,000 planets around other stars. This is phenomenal. It means that there are literally hundreds of more hundreds more times planets known that are outside of our solar systems that are known inside our solar system. As I said, there are these gobs and gobs of these so-called super-Earths, and these studies uh, based on Kepler data show that more than 50% of stars have a so-called super-Earth at orbital periods less than 50 days. This is interesting because there's no planet like this in, the, in, in our solar system. First of all, there's not a super-Earth. There's nothing between Earth and, and Neptune. And not only that, there's nothing at all anywhere to 50 days. So this whole region where we didn't even think that planets were possible is heavily populated with over half of, half of stars having these fairly massive planets there. On the other hand, the hot Jupiters that I mentioned are relatively rare by comparison. Only about 1% of stars have a hot Jupiter. In other words, a Jupiter mass planet that's, say, 20 times closer to a star. Um, so these super-Earths by far outnumber the hot Jupiters um, by factors of many dozens or, or even 100. This just shows a couple prominent examples from this, these 2,300 candidates. In fact, these are ones that are actually known to be planets that have been confirmed with multiple cross-checking techniques. Um, this one is Kepler 22b. Again, they just list them by number. Um, this, uh, again, we're seeing here the signature of the planet cr crossing in front of its star. Showed um, examples of this, and this just gives a sense of how good the data is for this planet. So this is a planet that is 2.4 Earth radius, uh, radii. Um, and so it's sort of intermediate, it's a super-Earth. It's intermediate between Earth and Neptune. And what's interesting is this planet is in the habitable zone of its star, meaning that if it were a, a terrestrial planet, if it was a rocky planet with an atmosphere similar to that of Earth and there was liquid water there, it would be able to maintain that liquid water in a liquid state. This is another planet. Uh, this is Kepler 20e. And in fact, this planet is smaller than Earth. This planet has only, is only 0.8 times the radius of Earth. In other words, it's only four-fifths the size of the Earth. So we're now discovering planets that are literally smaller than the Earth. And you can see the data is a little bit rattier, right? And the reason is simply because the transit signal is small. If you were to look at the numbers here, um, the, the fractional change in the flux associated with this dip is tiny. So it's sort of at the hairy edge of what, uh, of what Kepler can do. This is exactly what Kepler was designed for, is just to barely be able to detect these and not necessarily be, be able to detect smaller stuff. Still, this is actually a hot planet. This is a planet that's close to its star. It's very, it rotates uh, or orbits uh, rapidly. Um, it's not habitable. Um, and so what Kepler is, um, the goal of Kepler, but which it has not yet done, is to discover Earth-sized planets of the Earth or smaller that are in the habitable zones of their stars. We've discovered big planets in habitable zones and Earth-sized planets outside their habitable zones, but never the two together yet. And um, the continuing of the funding of Kepler for the next four years is to allow it to do precisely that. This gives a sense Kepler is not only discovering in individual planets, but of course planets tend to come in, in flocks. And one of the things that we didn't know before is, is what's the architecture of solar systems? When there are multiple planets in a system, are they in the same plane? How do their orbits relate to each other? What's the relative spacing of their orbits? Do they influence each other? And this gives a subset of the planets that Kepler has discovered that are in multiple planet systems. Most of those 2,300 candidates are just individual detections. There may be other planets there we haven't seen yet, but for most of those cases, we only know about that one planet. However, in this um, set here, about maybe 200 examples or so, um, there's actually more than one planet discovered that we know of in that system. And this just gives a sense of their relative um, sort of sizes and orbital radii. Um, so this is the so-called Kepler orrery. And so it's shown in, um, so every single, uh, uh, each of these symbols is a planet, and the size of the symbol is related to the size of the planet, so bigger circles mean planets with bigger radii, and the relative position of the orbits is the same. So here's an example, for instance, with three planets that are known, with a you know, small inner one, an intermediate one that's, um, an intermediate distance that's bigger, and an outermost one that's even bigger. 
Um, and then these are planets that are very tightly orbiting their stars. And so imagine this. It's really quite amazing looking at this because this is actually happening in nature. Even though you can't see it with your eye, if you sit there and look at the sky, all those little planets are going around their stars and producing these little transit signals. And this has been happening for billions of years. And we've only just in the last four years finally been able to see all of that activity. It's quite stunning. We're also learning about what these planets are made of using indirect methods. As I mentioned before, if you combine the Doppler method with the transit method, you can actually learn what the density is. In other words, the Doppler method gives you the mass, how much total stuff is in the planet. The uh, transit uh, method gives you the radius, how big it is. And if you combine those, you learn the density. You know, how is the stuff dense like iron or low density like water or hydrogen? It turns out that there are other more indirect ways to learn the mass. Uh, most Kepler planets are too small to actually use the Doppler method on. Um, but if there are multiple planets in, the, in a given system, they cause gravitational tugs on each other. However, the size of those tugs depends on the mass of the planet. If you imagine two planets that are very, very, very low in mass, they're not really going to influence each other that much. Their orbits will just be very regular um, around and around. If they're massive planets, they'll tug on each other. And so their orbits will develop irregularities because they're not just going around their star. They're also being tugged on by this other planet nearby. And so from that, from the, the, and that, what that, that tugging does is it changes the exact timing of when the transit occurs. And Kepler can detect that very precisely. And so from that, even without having the Doppler method, we can actually learn what the mass of the planets is. So for many of these Kepler planets, we know both their mass and their radius. And this shows planet mass and Earth masses. So one Earth mass, five Earth masses, 10 Earth masses. So Uranus and Neptune are out here. In fact, U means Uranus and N means Neptune. Here's the planet radius um, from one to four. So again, Uranus and Neptune are about four Earth radii. So the Earth and Venus are right here. Venus is very similar to the Earth in size and radius, mass and radius. And so here's these various points are some of these um, systems seen from Kepler. And so you can calculate from basic physics how, uh, for a given mass, how big planets would be for a given composition. So for example, suppose a planet had the same composition as Earth, but it was bigger. Uh, but it was, sorry, more massive. It would obviously be bigger. Um, but you know, if you make it more and more and more and more massive, then actually it gets, uh, you, you increase the pressures inside the planet and uh, the compressibility actually leads to the sort of bend over. Um, the details don't matter that much. The key point is simply that um, you know, here's something with Earth composition. Um, here would be a planet that's 100% water up here. So water is less dense than the rock and iron that make up the Earth, of course. So a planet of a given mass that's made of water would be bigger than the Earth. Um, and uh, you know, here's one that's sort of 50% water and 50% rock. And planets, when you start adding hydrogen, hydrogen's very light, and even compared to water. And so then you can make planets that are really puffy and really um, low density by adding hydrogen. And so by comparing these theoretical calculations with these data points, we can actually learn what these planets are made of. Um, and so for example, um, we know that these planets here are so dense that they're probably just rock balls. They could still have an atmosphere because the Earth's atmosphere does not make the Earth much bigger. Um, you know, when you fly in a 747, at the, you know, you're only 10, you know, 10 kilometers, six miles above the surface, which is compared to the you know, 4,000 mile radius of the Earth is nothing, right? So the thickness of the Earth's atmosphere is tiny and doesn't change the radius much. So these planets could still have atmospheres, but they're basically rocky planets. They're not hydrogen planets. They're not water planets. On the other hand, these planets out here could be made of water, or maybe they're made of a 50-50 mix of hydrogen and rock. We don't really know. It could be either of those. These planets out here have to have more and more hydrogen. So Uranus and Neptune are a mix of hydrogen and, and water and other species, all in a kind of a fluid, hot fluid state. So and this is allowing us then to make inferences about um, atmospheres. Let me also, toward the end here, say that there's an opportunity around uh, for looking at different types of stars um, to learn things. So um, most of the uh, characterization efforts that I described at the beginning are being done for these very hot, very massive planets. We want to be able to extend those characterization methods to Earth-sized planets. We can't do that yet. That's one of the major goals of this field that's going to happen in the next 20 years. But what's interesting is that some stars are not that big. There are red dwarfs, which uh, we call M dwarfs in the, in the lingo. And those stars um, can be up to 10 times smaller than the, than the sun is. And so if you have an Earth-sized planet that's going in front of such a tiny star, it will block a relatively large fraction of the star's disk, even though it's a small planet. In comparison, if the Earth itself is going in front of the sun, it's hardly blocking anything, so it's hard to get a signal. 
Therefore, it's easier to detect small planets around these dim red dwarfs. And these are the most common stars in the galaxy. Um, the sun is sur literally surrounded by these stars. They far outnumber the more massive stars as, um, as bright as the sun or more. And there's an example of one that was discovered around a nearby red dwarf. Uh, that red dwarf is called GJ1214b. And this planet has a radius of about 2.7 Earth radii, and it's about six times more massive than the Earth. But because it's orbiting in front of a red dwarf star, we can actually characterize it. We're starting to actually get spectra of its atmosphere, constraining the composition. This is just early days yet, so there'll be a lot of updates on this over the next couple of years. But we're now, and this is again a super Earth planet, intermediate between the Earth and Neptune. And we're now literally at the cusp of being able to characterize those planets. I'm kind of out of time here, so I won't dwell on this in detail, but just to say that in the case of the solar system, we have this kind of Goldilocks problem. You know, if the Earth is just right, Mars is too cold, and Venus is uh, too hot, and we're starting to have some understanding um, from just studying these, our lo these local planets of how that works. And, um, and so um, we're going to be able to merge this field then with exoplanet science in the near future. Maybe I'll just skip this. And then the final goal then is to, this is actually an image of the Earth, taken from the Voyager spacecraft when the Voyager was 4 billion miles from the Earth, 30% farther than Pluto is from the Earth. The Voyager camera turned back toward Earth and took this picture. And eventually, we would like to uh, fully understand the place of Earth in the cosmos um, and in the context of all these other planets. So that's something I think we'll be doing in the next 20 years. So I'll stop there. Thanks. <laughs> And we've got time for a few questions. We uh, are recording this, so if you would raise your hand, and we've got a couple of microphones, and we'll ask you to use the microphone. You mentioned that uh, the size of the suns are different in many of these cases. What is the effect of the size of the sun on the properties of the planet? The uh, physical size of the star is going to alter the amount of flux that the planet receives, the amount of light the planet gets from the star. If a star is huge, huge stars um, in most cases tend to be um, Dim. Stars that are much, much bigger than the Earth, for example, are so-called red giants. Um, Betelgeuse is an example. You know, the star on the, one of the shoulders of Orion is a star that is literally, um, if that star were placed in the solar system, then all the planets out to Jupiter would actually be inside that star. Um, the surface of the star is not that bright, but when a star is that big, it's just blasting an enormous amount of light out into space. And so a planet orbiting that star will be receiving a huge amount of light. What that means is that the so-called habitable zone, the regions um, where you're getting the right amount of, of energy from your star to have liquid water, um, that's at a larger distance. It's a, that's at a further separation from the star when the star is, is um, bright and when it's large. Whereas when stars are, are small and dim, they still have habitable zones, but that's much closer in. So if the sun was much, much less, uh, much, much smaller than, than uh, you know, uh, than it actually is, for example, um, then the Earth would get a lot less light and the Earth would probably not be habitable. What can you tell us uh, with regard to the planets out there that have been discovered so far about the actual masses or the ranges of masses and the ranges of um, sizes of the, pl uh, of the stars themselves with those planets that have thus far been discovered? Yeah, so um, in most cases, we have a pretty good sense of that, of that. I mean, we can measure how, you know, the light and the spectrum from the, from the star. And in some cases, if the star is close enough, then um, through a parallax, in other words, as the Earth goes around its orbit, if the star is close, it'll shift position slightly in the sky and allow us to know how far it is so we can get its, its um, we know how bright it is, not just as seen in the sky, but it's so-called absolute luminosity, the absolute amount of radiation that's pouring out into space. 
And stars tend to be simpler than planets, it turns out. And there's a well-developed field, about 100 years old now, of understanding um, the particular properties of stars that um, can predict those things reasonably well. So there's some uncertainty in, the, in for example, the size of the star itself. Um, but you know, that can be estimated, in most cases, um, fairly well through this uh, you know, modeling and comparing that with the observations. Still, I might say that um, you know, for these cases of transits, um, what, you, what the data is actually giving you is not the size of the planet. It's giving you the ratio of the size of the planet to the size of the star. Um, that's the actual observations. And it turns out that the error um, in uh, the, 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 our uncertainty in the radii is actually dominated by um, the uncertainty, not from the actual data themselves, but from their uncertainty in what the actual stellar radius is. There's usually about a 10% uncertainty in exactly how big the star is, which even if you have perfect data, translates directly into a 10% uncertainty in the radius of the planet. Do you tend to find that um, it's easier to find stars around or planets around very large stars because you again have a wider range of um, of axial tilts that are in your view, or around smaller uh, stars because for a given size of the planet it takes up more of a ratio of the su stars area that you can see? I think we're just beginning to sort that out right now. Um, the for example the Doppler techniques um, that I described at the beginning. Um, Typically, we're not done in what you might call an unbiased way. They, on purpose, chose stars that would be easier, uh, that we understood better, and that would be easier to sort of get a decent signal from. So they chose stars on purpose that were like the, the, the um, you know, the, the sun. And there are some other stars that either are, um, you know, active where they have flares or there's lots of kind of motion on the surface of the star, sort of jitter that kind of screws up the measurements. And so at the beginning, people kind of avoided um, focusing on those. Um, so I, but most of the stars in, that we know of are around stars that are, most of the planets we know of are around stars that are not too dissimilar from, from the sun and their overall properties. We do not know of so many planets around these, um, these red dwarfs, um, but that's an area that I think has not yet been, been well characterized. At the beginning, I also mentioned these um, planets that are being directly imaged. And for whatever reason, most of those are actually around um, very gigantic hot stars. Um, there's only a handful of those known yet, so it's not yet understood if there's some observational bias maybe or, or it's just randomness um, or if there's, for some reason, there's actually more planets there at large distances. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, in order for the transit method to work, we have to be seeing a, a solar system where the planet's ecliptic plane, where the ecliptic plane of the solar system is, is in line with us and the star. That's right. And what are we learning about the distribution of, of ecliptic planes? Are they, are they, are they distributed in, 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 a, in a normal way or are they, or are they uniformly distributed? And, and what do we expect to see when we start using additional methods uh, like the parallax method to look for, for, uh, for other planets? Yeah, so um, from the measurements we have now, we don't have a good answer to the question. Um, so from, it turns out that um, if a planet is transiting, you can actually learn what its inclination is. It's obviously, it has to be within this tiny range, but it turns out that the um, shape of the transit itself tells you something about um, which sort of stellar latitude it's crossing. Is it going right across the equator or is it just clipping sort of the, you know, near the pole of the star, for example? Um, and so we, within that tiny range, we do have information, but we do not at this point, I think, have like a good sense of, of whether they're randomly distributed. You kind of would expect them to be. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if you have de information from the Doppler method, let's say, let's say a planet's not transiting, so which means it's not lined up to toward Earth, and you have information from the Doppler method. You, it could be that it's almost lined up um, toward, the, toward Earth, in which case the planet's going around like this and it's tugging its star mostly toward and away from Earth. And so you're getting, there's a huge Doppler signature from that. Um, or it could be that it's almost face on, or most of the motion is perpendicular to you, and there's actually no Doppler signature from that. And so, but a, a still, a massive planet that's almost face on um, could produce the same amplitude of Doppler signal as a less massive planet that's lined up with you. And so there's a degeneracy is what that means. Um, and if you only, all you have is the Doppler data, you can only learn the lower limit on the transit, on the, uh, on the mass, and you don't know anything about the inclination. 
But it's possible, there's another method I didn't discuss because it hasn't yet discovered any planets, um, but there's the so-called wobble method, which is called astrometry in the field. So there you just stare at the star and you just hope that you see the star actually wiggle back and forth in the sky um, due to the, due to the uh, planet tugging it back and forth. That gives you very complementary information to the Doppler method. And if we start discovering planets that way, we'll be able to answer your question. Among all the planets that have been studied up to date, is there, are, are there any with the potential to be so close to Earth in terms of properties that Earth's type of life could exist there? Not yet. As I was saying, that's, doing so is the goal of Kepler. Kepler was designed specifically to be able to discover planets around sun-like stars that are the size of Earth and orbiting at the same distance as Earth is from the sun, which is in the habitable zone. We haven't yet done that. So we've discovered lots of Earth-sized planets, or a handful of Earth-sized planets, which happen to not be in their habitable zones. It could be that some of the bigger planets um, you know, for instance, there's a two, this 2.4 Earth radius planet that's inside its habitable zone. So if that were a solid planet um, with water, then it could, um, it could uh, you know, potentially harbor life. But that's sort of 2.4 Earth radii is kind of at the hairy edge of whether it's basically a giant fluid hydrogen ball, uh, or sorry, a giant fluid water ball that doesn't have a surface to stand on, or whether it's like Earth. So I would say probably the answer is that we have not discovered that yet, but um, we will in the next four years, I think. So let's thank the speaker one more time.